Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us tonight for Old Windows Aren't a Pain, They're a Gold Mine. We're going to talk with Bob Yep about how to restore your windows and why you should restore them and why they are fabulous. Um, I just wanted to go over some basic, basic things for tonight um, before we do get going. Um, and I'll repeat this uh, before we, we really get into it. But if everyone could just make sure that their speaker view is on, um, I think on your typical sort of computer or laptop, it'll be on the top right uh, where you can select what kind of a view you have. So be sure you click on speaker view because uh, we're not going to do uh, PowerPoint for this. Bob's doing it, kicking it old style and really showing us what's going on tonight, um, which is part of why we're excited about this webinar. So um, just, just be sure and select that. Um, also, you're going to notice that the chat is disabled. And um, that is because we just want all of your questions to go into the Q&A section over on the right. So make sure you type into the Q&A. Um, it's far right, I think, for most of us. Um, and all of those questions, I'll be going through some of them during the presentation. And then definitely at the end, we're going to have some time uh, to get through as many questions as we can. Uh, Bob's probably going to talk for about an hour and a half, so until around 7.30ish, and then we're going to go and get as many questions in as we can by 8 p.m. We're going to have a hard stop at 8. So um, again, make sure you're in speaker view, uh, chat is disabled, type into the Q&A, and we're going to get through as much of this as we can by 8 p.m. with you guys. Um, yeah, I would just like to introduce Bob more formally now. We've known Bob, he's done stuff with the Bungalow Association since our organization was like a preteen, I think, um, maybe even younger. So um, I went to school for historic preservation. So of course, I know all about Bob Yap. He's a really big deal. Um, everybody, uh, you know, is, is kind of in love with him and his work um, that he's done. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, Bob's been involved with the restoration and rehabilitation of over 160 historic properties. In 1996, Bob produced and hosted the national PBS series About Your House with Bob Yap. The 52 show series was co-underwritten uh, co by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Bob's one of the founding members of the National Window Preservation Standards Collaborative. Bob travels around the US giving keynote speeches, conducting seminars and hands-on workshops on just about any subject having to do with historic preservation, housing and community. Bob is also a regular member of the design panel for the National Endowment for the Arts in Washington, DC, as well as a founding member of the National Window Preservation Standards Collaborative. He recently restored all of the cupola, oxi, and greenhouse windows at George Washington's Mount Vernon home. Bob's first book, About Your House, was published by Bay Books in December 1997, and he is also a co-author and co-editor of the National Window Preservation Standards, which was published in 2013. Bob is the president of Preservation Resources, Inc., based in Hannibal, Missouri, where he lives with his wife, Pat, and their dogs, George and Gomer. Their 1859 antebellum home is a brick Italianate located in the Central Park National Historic District. The home is headquarters for Bob's school, the Belvedere School for Hands-On Preservation, as well as the Belvedere Inn Bed and Breakfast, which I continually threaten to visit. <laughs> Promise I will soon. <laughs> um, you might be, actually, I think you're muted, Bob. So I just want to make sure that you're unmuted by the time we get going. Okay. All right. Perfect. Um, okay. One more reminder, just because I know people keep coming on. Um, please put all of your questions um, that you'd like to have answered in the Q&A section. Uh, we're going to wrap up Bob's uh, presentation sometime around 7.30 tonight. And then we're going to take as many questions as we can by 8 p.m. Um, we'll try to get as much as we can. Uh, but um, I think a lot of them are probably going to be answered along the way as well. So uh, without further ado, you can take it from here. Oh, and uh, everyone, please, I'm sorry, make sure that you're on speaker view for this as well. Thanks. Speaker view. Okay, speaker. I'm going to go right in here and I'm going to do speaker view. Yes, and I will be in the background. I'm going to take my face off the screen so I don't do anything embarrassing, but I'll be in the background if there's any tech issues as well. Okay. Thanks, Carla. My pleasure. All right, so all I see is you, and now I see you on a mountain. So anyway, welcome everybody. I hope everybody can see me because I'm not seeing me. Yeah, can um, really, actually really quick, I'm sorry. Um, can folks type really quick into the Q&A if, um, if you see Bob? Yeah. And also just to answer one question, we are recording this tonight, so this will be available afterwards as well. Okay, looks like, okay. Everybody can see you, Bob. 
All right, that's fine. Okay. Well, that's uh, Thanks, welcome, to, uh, well, welcome to my basement woodworking studio in America's hometown, Hannibal, Missouri. Uh, it's amazing that we ended up here in 2008, but we traveled all over the country looking for the right place to open the Belvedere School for Hands-On Preservation. And we picked Hannibal. Uh, it has a great tourism base. Uh, we knew we were going to be opening an inn in 2015. So it worked out really well. And we have a full woodworking shop down here for the students to use. And, and I'm, uh, I'm set up down here. And I'm glad to have you all here today. Uh, I want to ask a question that's really important. And you need to be honest about it. How many of you would consider yourselves to be preservationists or preservation friendly? And I, 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 you know, I can see, raise your hand. I know I, I can see it. So what I need you to do is talk to Carla when this is done, because you need to get over it. Everybody knows that preservation is a left-wing conspiracy to take away your property rights. Everybody knows that the paint police are going to come out to your house and tell you what you can do with your bathroom and kitchen. And of course, none of that is true. The bottom line is in Chicago, the most iconic house in America is the Chicago bungalow. I really, uh, Carla mentioned that I was around uh, working with, with all these folks when this first started up. Uh, Mayor Daley, too, uh, had a lot to do with it because he grew up in a bungalow, a Chicago bungalow. And I'll, I'll never forget the first, um, the first conference that, that you guys had. I'm standing out in the back to get a little fresh air before I, 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 I'm inside giving some talks. And a big limo and a bunch of cop cars pull up in the back. And Daly gets out and he sees me and he's like, oh, my God, you're like Bob. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. And you're Mayor Daly. And he says, you, you, you smoke cigars? I said, well, maybe. He said, here. So we smoked two Cuban cigars together before I went on the stage to talk to folks about similar to what I'm going to do today. So it was kind of an interesting conversation. I was surprised that he knew who I was. But what a lot of people may or may not know, especially younger people, because there's, there's nine people who watch the show that are over 50, um, is that... Um, it was actually, uh, every PBS show has a, what we call a presenting station. And that presenting station was WTTW in Chicago. PBS said, you know, oh, well, you know, you have to have a presenting station like, like uh, this old, I mean, this old house, that show out in Massachusetts. And of course the Boston station is their, their organization to do that. And WTTW was mine in Chicago because we're Midwest where real people live. Right. So we're here tonight to talk about windows. My first encounter with windows happened when I was a senior in high school. I was 17 years old. Uh, my buddy Mark and I were building sets at the community theater in Des Moines called the Des Moines Community Theater, still the longest running community theater in the country. And it was the early found one of the early founders was Horace Leachman who was an actor that some of you may remember, who passed away here recently. Uh, and we were volunteering, and a gay couple came up to us and said, you know, you guys brag an awful lot about all that money you earned in your paper routes. And we had, we had saved up 10 grand between us. And they said, so, so we're moving to San Francisco. Now, you have to remember, this is 1974. And uh, they said, you know, we'll feel safer in San Francisco. I grew up in Des Moines, Iowa. And uh, you should buy our house. And I'm like, whatever, man, we're in high school. I can't buy your house. How would we do that? And he says, well, just come out and look at it. So we followed him out there. It was on the side of town that, you know, my dad always said, you know, don't go over there, right? And uh, on the other side of the tracks, actually, it was a beautiful neighborhood. It had a park called Union Park that was dedicated by Teddy Roosevelt after he had an epiphany that unions were not a bad thing. <clears throat> And he, uh, uh, so this house was, I drove up and it had a, like a tuck under garage with a cross buck door. It had a porch with casement windows overlooking the park, it had a little balcony above it. It was stucco on the first floor, it was cedar shingle on the second. The windows had all these multiple panes of glass in them. And we went inside and it was like, wow, look at all this woodwork and beam ceilings. There was like a built in hutch in the dining room it looked hardware looked like somebody had beat on it with a hammer 
and the woodwork was all stripy and, and, and it came with brand new lime green shag carpet. And they said, if we bought the house, they'd even give us the plastic rake so that we could get it up there, like, you know, a moose hairdo. And uh, of course it was back in the seventies. And um, we're like, well, okay. So we go upstairs and there's what we call a scuttle hole in the ceiling. And a scuttle hole is a way to get up into the attic if you don't have a staircase to it. And so I said, can I climb up there and take a look? So I climbed up there and all over in the corner were all these rolls of wallpaper. And I, I hollered down, I said, can I bring these down? They said, sure, we didn't even know where they were there. So I brought them down and we got them down in the living room, we unrolled them and they weren't wallpaper, they were the original blueprints. And as we unrolled them, a catalog fell out and it was dog-eared on a page and I opened it up and there's the house. And I looked at the front page and it said, Gustav Stickley's Craftsman Home Catalog. And the prints were signed by Gustav Stickley. And I'm, I'm like, wow, I wonder who that guy is, you know? I mean, most of us, especially uh, folks that live in bungalows have probably heard of Gustav Stickley, who was the founder of the arts and crafts movement in America from 1900 to about 1930. And uh, I said, so, okay, so how do we buy this house? He said, well, we'll sell it to you for 18,000 bucks. You give us 2,000 down, you guys had 10, you'll have eight. You can put the eight into it and sell it before you graduate and make some money. And we're like, cool, let's do it. So we did it. And we, of course, being a good Iowa boy, I called Pella Windows and I got a bid to replace all the windows in the house. And I went to the siding company because, you know, back in that, there wasn't vinyl siding back then, but there was aluminum siding. And you were not groovy if you didn't have really wide aluminum siding, sort of like, you know, the lapels on a leisure suit. So we got bids for that. It had its original cedar shingled roof from 1904 and it was leaking. Um, so we got a bid to put a three tab asphalt shingled roof and all new sheeting on it. And we got all the bids together and they were way more than we could afford. It was like almost $30,000 and we were just in tears because now what are we gonna do? So I walked over to the windows and you know the ropes were broken the putty was falling out i opened it up and put a stick underneath it to hold it in place and on the side was a little trap door and i'm like mark come here this is cool and we took the screw out and we opened it up and there were sash weights in there and of course i back in those days i know it's hard to believe but we we're thinking man we could stash stuff in there not kidding but sort of anyway um the bottom line is is that the windows looked to me to be repairable, just a dumb kid. And I, uh, so then we, you know, we, we, we pulled back the shag carpet and we bought a six pack of beer and I spilled a beer on the floor and I got a rag and started, tried to wipe it up and the finish on the floor, which was just black, couldn't even see the wood, started to come on. And I'm like, wow, okay. So we'll go to the hardware store, we'll get some alcohol, we can strip the woodwork and the floors with alcohol because it, I didn't know it was shellac, but that's what it was. And we'll get some uh, DAP 33, which we'll talk about here in a minute, because everybody had that red can on their on their benches or their grandpa's or their father's benches. And uh, we'll get some, there's a little bit of rot on the bottoms of the windows, but why don't we get some, like go to an auto store and buy some Bondo, because that's what they fix cars with. Of course, Bondo bad, don't ever use Bondo, <laughs> but... But that's what was available at the time because there really uh, there were no architectural epoxies that were readily available to anyone. Plus, there wasn't a lot of information in general. And so what I found out at the library was this eight-page, three-hole punch newsletter called the Old House Journal. And it was a newsletter published by this guy named Clem Labine. Now, Clem has been in our business forever, and he is, he is an icon of historic preservation. And he was doing brownstones in New England. And he wrote this and it turned into a great magazine, probably the best old house magazine on the market today, much better than this old house magazine, which is just just about selling product, um, which, which is sort of sad. So that was an interesting uh, uh, thing. So we got the windows all reputtied and we got them painted and we painted the outside of the house instead of siding it. And we found out that we could buy cedar shingle cedar shingles just like the original ones you know clear hard grain straight grain and put them on ourselves for less money than hiring a roofer to put on the sheathing over the old skip boards and then the you know and then the asphalt shingles 
And we put that on and we got it all dolled up and we called a realtor and we said, you know, can we sell it for like uh, 35,000? And she looked at it and she said, no, we're going to put it on the market for 82. And it sold for 84 the first day it was on the market. We go to the bank market and I thought that, that we were the richest 17 year olds on the face of the planet. We went to the bank to close and the banker's like getting everybody's IDs. And he says, well, you guys can't sign the deed. You're not even 18. You have to go get your parents. So we walked outside and Mark and I looked at each other and went, because we never told our parents that we bought this house. And the bottom line is, is that I had to go tell my dad. Mom, now my dad was this suit, six foot 10, gigantic man. And I said, Dad, you know, Mark and I bought a house over on the east side. And he said, you did what? You little liar. You told your mother you were going to the library and all these dates with these girls. You're over there working on some crappy house on the east side. And I said, and we paid 16 for it and we put 10 in it and we sold it for 84 grand. And he stopped, and put his arm around me and he said, what a fine capitalist boy you are. <laughs> and it's been downhill for me since then. So I, I decided at that point in time that buying historic endangered houses and rehabbing them was a better way for me to go than to go into general contracting. Not that I don't like customers, it's just a lot easier for me to do a property uh, according to the Secretary of the Interior Standards, which I soon learned about. Um, I then went and did a four-year apprenticeship as a furniture maker with a German furniture uh, maker, an internationally known guy named Robert Krebsbach. And I came back, went to college for a while, I'm buying houses all the while I'm doing it. Every single property that I've done in my life has been something that the community thought should be torn down. Uh, the house that we're sitting in now, the, the uh, Alfred Lamb house in the Central Park National Historic District, there was a developer who wanted to tear it down and build a, a, an eight-story low-income housing unit, uh, like a mini Cabrini Green. And of course, you know, we, we now know that scatter siting of public housing is a better way to go than putting everybody together in one place. It just doesn't work out very well. So anyway, bottom line is that I've been in this a long, long time and I never get tired of it. I love it. Now, in all my development projects, and they, got, they, they range from a party wall downtown, small town buildings. That's a party wall, meaning buildings that are adjoining single family homes, lots and lots of arts and crafts era bungalows, Queen Anne's, Victorian era stuff. Um, I have never replaced a window in a single property. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, if I did replace the windows, my windows would be less energy efficient than a replacement. And number two, as a developer, I like to make a 10, 12% profit. And if I replaced all the windows, I'd be upside down on the property and I'd end up owing more than it was worth. And that's kind of the reality outside of big cities. Now I've done projects in San Francisco and South Bend, Indiana, worked on some stuff outside of Chicago. I've done all kinds of different places. But the one thing that I think is really interesting about uh, the Midwest is that what the folks on the coast don't understand is that there's more historic preservation going on in the Midwest, in the center of the country, from, from, from the Gulf Coast actually north, uh, even Texas and all these other states, all the way up to Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. There's more preservation going on in that center belt of this country than both coasts combined. Now, if you talk to folks from the coast, they, they don't buy into it. But, but if you run the numbers, uh, our colleague Donovan Ripkema is the king of running numbers, he and his staff, and, and they've run a lot of numbers over the years. And he's always suggesting that I look at numbers, uh, which I have. Um, I have he, he said, what's the percentage of labor for, if you take all these projects you've been involved in, and my involvement in 160 plus projects is direct ownership, partnerships, uh, project management, uh, consulting all these different projects from the, on all these different projects over the years. So I went back and I looked at all this information. And what I found was that 73.2% of my projects went to labor. Now, this is an interesting statistic because in new construction, about 40% goes to uh, labor and 60% to materials. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because preservation sort of gets a bad rap for being expensive. 
And it is labor intensive, but it's not material intensive. And so it ends up costing, I think, in, in my mind, much less per square foot to do the rehab of a historic bungalow in Chicago than it does to go out to a cornfield development and build a snout house. That's a house with where the most architecturally redeeming feature is a three-car garage on the front, right? So the other thing that he suggested I look at is how much I, it's cost me per square foot over the years to rehab. And my rehab costs have never exceeded $100 a square foot. And they average in the mid $85 range. You can't build a new house for that. You just can't. Uh, and... Uh, so it's all about developing methods that make it cost effective to do things. And I've especially worked hard on that over the years on windows. I get tagged as a window guy, but you know, we teach everything here at the school. We teach, we, well, we just teach every, every trade that there is that you can think of um, that has to do with preservation. And I do it on the road as well. So bottom line is that preservation doesn't cost, it pays and it pays when you have, a, if you have a Chicago bungalow or you're in a Chicago bungalow neighborhood and you've got something from the arts and crafts era that's there, maybe not the exact Chicago bungalow, there's probably what, 10 to 20 different variations of Chicago bungalows, <laughs> if not more. Um, one of the most repairable aspects of that house are the windows. Window, old windows are repairable. They're made to repair. Today, we can't repair new replacement windows. That is an issue. Now, there are some exceptions, but in general, you can't repair them. So it's interesting to look at the data. So in 2019, the window industry, the replacement window, I call them window pirates. Uh, John Leak, my buddy out in Maine, uh, calls them the window pirates. So I steal that from him, but I always try to give him credit for that. Um, they are... It was a nine and a half billion dollar industry in 2019. Nine and a half billion. Now we throw billion around like it's nothing, but that's substantial for one aspect of the construction industry. It's, that's actually quite huge. So if you extrapolate that out and you can't figure out, you know, the general cost for for each opening and all that, that comes out to about 112 million window sashes that end up in the dump in this country every single year. Now, it was a little bit less in 2018, a little bit more in 2019. So when we get done looking at 2020 and 2021, I'm sure that it'll be over 10 billion. I mean, people were spending money through the, through the pandemic like crazy on their houses and sometimes not making the best decisions. So the bottom line is, is that we now know that that many window sashes are going out to the landfill. Now that's insanity. Uh, Professor Rathje uh, in a graduate program, the University of Arizona down in Tucson, had a graduate program called the Garbology Study. And they would go out and core drill landfills all over the country and they bring up the, you know, look at the different layers. And he would ask his students before they went out, what do you think we're gonna find? And they'd say, you know, well, we're gonna find milk jugs and baby diapers and, 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 and plastic uh, water bottles and all this kind of thing. And what was astonishing was that almost 40% of everything they pulled up was construction debris and demolition debris. So why does that matter? Uh, all those windows, 112 million windows, oh my God. Well, the embodied energy that was used to make those windows so all of the pollution that was used to create, the, uh, to, to fire up the, uh, the kiln to make the bricks, to fire up uh, the, uh, the ovens to, to make the glass, to, uh, you know, all that pollution was spent back in the, after the turn of the century in Chicago, after the big fire and the bungalows were coming in. And, and, and even the guys scooping manure behind the carts that were delivering materials to the job sites, his labor or her labor, probably his back in the day, um, were, had value. And so all this embodied energy that we, where, where, where we have the labor, we have the pollution that was spent, ends up in the landfill and we're just throwing them away. And, and we're throwing them away because of the big lie. And the big lie is that old windows cannot be made energy efficient. 
And it's, it's truly one of the biggest scams in the history of construction and architecture in this country. One of, the, one of the early scams was dimensional lumber, right? So a two by four used to be a two by four and they, that's a whole nother issue. But the bottom line is, is that windows can be. Now, uh, Carla mentioned that I'm one of the founders of the National Window Preservation uh, Standards Collaborative, which is a long name for a group of uh, five of us that, that founded this organization. Um, uh, John Leake, myself, Jim Turner, David Gibney, um, and um, uh, some other folks. Anyway, we started this, and the idea was is that we've all been working on conjecture for years, and and for the last twenty years, we've all in the business have said, look, it, it, it's cool to say if you put a wood storm on that house, it's going to be make it more energy efficient, but it's not enough. We need science and data. And I really learned that from Donovan Ripkema. Don is uh, it just, it, he is a data-driven human being. And if you've never, if you've never experienced uh, Don Ripkema, go to Place Economics uh, online and check him out because he studies the economics of preservation in ways that no one ever thought of and does such an incredible job. Um, but we have to look at the economic side of it as well as the data side and the science that goes with it. So we go down to Pine Mountain, Kentucky to have our first big summit and we're gonna do some testing. <laughs> Pine Mountain, Kentucky is in this wholly remote place in the middle of the Appalachian Mountains in Kentucky. Um, and it, 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 it really was started because of Chicago. Everything, there's so much that, that Chicago has influenced around good architecture, and, and good preservation as time has gone on. So Jane Adams, many of you have heard of Jane Adams. She essentially invented social work as we know it today. She was doing the settlement houses and uh, uh, settlement schools and things like that all over the Chicago area to help underserved children and young people uh, to get a better foot up. And it was fantastic. And a couple of her colleagues, elderly women, said to her, look, what about all these rural kids? You know, we're ignoring them. And I think Adams' attitude was, look, I can only do so much. If you want to help rural kids, go forth and help them. And so these two old ladies bought three mules and they took those three mules and they rode into the Appalachian Mountains. They didn't know where they were going. They didn't know anything. And they met a, a fellow named Creech. C-R-E-E-C-H. It's a great Appalachian name. It's very common up there. And he owned Pine Mountain and the valley below. And they negotiated with him. And he said, I'll give you the mountain and I'll give you the valley below if you build a settlement school to teach our kids. So they hired a female uh, architect named Hooker out, uh, out of Kansas City. This is a woman whose father was the biggest developer in Kansas City and wouldn't let her go to architecture school. So she let, ran away from home, went to Paris and went to architecture school, came back, her father refused to hire her. So she opened her own architecture firm. Thank goodness things have changed, right? I'm gonna talk about women and preservation in a little, in a little while because it's really important. <clears throat> but so they built this thing and, and, she, and Mary Hooker, she, she designed you know all these like 30 structures, uh, timber frame, log cabins, uh, German country, Tudor, uh, just lodge style. I mean, it's unbelievable. And then it was, a, you know, a residential school for many, many years. And then the kids quit coming to live there and it waned for a bit. So we opened the Pine Mountain School for Practical Preservation down there to help bring people in, working with the Park Service, working with the Trust, working with all the different SHPOs. So we went down there for the first summit. Now we were funded by the National Park Service, SHPO's all over the country. SHPO is an acronym for State Historic Preservation Office uh, or Officer. And uh, if I use an acronym, uh, slap me in the question and answers. Um, and so I had to raise $100,000 to hire this energy tester to come down there. His name was Chip. Anyway, he tested for Anderson and Marvin and Pella and all the big companies. And what we've determined with windows and old houses in general is that thermal capability on the, for windows and sidewalls of old buildings is irrelevant. 
uh, buildings work like chimneys and the air moves up through them. So we want a lot of really good insulation in our attics and we want to we want to plug up all the holes for the plumbing and the wiring and all that all the way up and down so that we stop some of that airflow. But we need to stop excessive air infiltration. That's our number one issue. And so we wanted to test to see if a whole bank of double hung windows, one over the, on the top, one on the bottom, actually designed to be an air conditioning system. Some of the earliest ones were found in England in the late 1500s. As you drop the top sash and let the heat out the top and raise the bottom sash and let the cooler breezes come in through there. And there's a whole bank of them. So we left one alone. We did uh, some weather stripping on one with no storm. We did one with weather stripping and a conventional puttied storm. And then we did one with, a, with weather stripping on the sashes and what we call a convertible wood storm, which is a wood storm that you put up and the glass and screen panels come out from the inside with turnbuckles. I'll show you one in here in a little bit. And then we did one with, 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 with an interior air panel John Lee came up with. It was brilliant. And it's just, you know, how people put the shrink wrap on the insides of windows and that kind of thing. Well, he came up with one with a, with a simple little frame that, that fr friction fits into the opening. And the guy goes in, he seals everything off, he starts the air testing, and he's supposed to be done the first day, and he won't come out. And interns are, are slipping food to him underneath the, the door. And, and, and so he does a whole nother round of testing the next day, and he still won't come out. <laughs> Third day, he finally comes out after he tested again early in the morning, and he, and he hasn't taken a shower, and he smells, and he hasn't shaved. And he gets up in front of everybody and he said, this is a, a, an eye-opening day for me. Uh, these windows have less air infiltration than any replacement window that I've tested. And he said, I just couldn't believe it because like I told you, I was glad to take your money to do this, but it wasn't gonna happen. And of course our response was, we want you to do the testing and whatever the uh, results are, we will publish them in this, in this book right here. And this is the window preservation standards. And the Window Preservation Standards is a book that gives all the best practices for how uh, for, for window uh, preservation and weatherization, as well as the science and data involved in our testing and other links that you can go to to look at the science and data, which actually proves over and over again what I'm saying. Berkeley Labs in California is a Department of Energy uh, testing lab. They find the same thing. I mean, there's just so much testing out there. The consumers are bombarded with information about why they should replace their windows, you know. But the biggest one, of course, is what the industry calls insulated glass. Well, let's think about that. Glass is the worst thermal unit of all construction materials that there are. Windows were never designed to do anything but to be open so you can get fresh air and to let light in so that you can see inside the house. They, so that you can also see your yard or see the river. In my house, we see the, the whole Mississippi Valley and the beautiful Mississippi River, and that's what the windows are for. They were never intended to be a thermal unit. Uh, if you want insulated glass, you literally have to have this. This is a piece of true insulated glass. Now, what, what, what's interesting to me about the guy that was in one of my classes that worked for a big window company that made insulated glass, made this up for me before he came. That's a piece of fiberglass in there because that's the only way you can truly insulate glass. How do we quantify the thermal uh, capability of windows? Well, for a long time, the vinyl pirates, the window industry, the replacement industry, they uh, used R value. Now, if we think about R value, I'm going to put this up here. So R value is uh, quantifies the thermal capability of insulation, not windows, but they glommed onto it. And of course, the higher the R value, the better. We know that about insulation. Then leave it to the Europeans because the British came up with the U value. Now, the lower the U value, the better the, the thermal capability. So a vinyl window out of the box with a double pane window is about a 0.55, a 0.55, that's its U value. 
So remember, the lower it is, the better it is. So if you go to a triple pane window with argon gas and low E coatings, you know, those coatings that make your house look like your has a black eye, you're going to get about a 0.30 or so, somewhere in there. And I say or so because it's uh, difficult uh, to, you know, every test has some, some on one side or the other. So it's an average. So when we restore windows and weatherize the primary window sashes, the double hungs, and we put a good storm on, we're getting about a 0 0.30 as well in the R value. So, but it's really insignificant. The difference between a 0 0.30 and a 0.55 is, you know, 0.25, right? So you're not talking about a big difference to start with. And the average payback, so if you replace a window, the average payback, if you extrapolate out all of this data, is running around 42 years, 42 years. Now in the construction industry, anything that has a payback over 20 years is considered not a payback whatsoever. So in other words, you save enough energy over 42 years to pay for that, that, that job. So let's go back to the 112 million window sashes that are going to our dump every single year. And let's look at what that's made up of. Well, what's interesting is 15, 20 years ago, it was all old growth windows. Here's an old window right here, you know, typical old window. And that's what was ending up in the dump. Today, we're estimating that somewhere between 45 and 50%, so somewhere around 50 to 56 million of that 112 million window sashes that are going to the dump are less than 20 years old. And some of them are the second and third replacements that have been replaced since the, the replacement industry started kicking in so hard in the, in the 70s. Um, that, so, so if you replace your windows, you're putting something in there that won't last as long as a quality carpet or a three tab shingled roof. And, you know, people say to me, well, I don't care. The average person only lives in their house seven years. Well, I think that's an interesting statement because it's a statement to what we've become. We've become a throwaway society. It's like the McDonald's syndrome. We want it fast. We want it cheap and we don't want to lift a finger. And there is no such thing as no maintenance. Any product that says it's maintenance free just means you can't maintain it. That's all that means. It means it's a throwaway product. And throwaway products aren't helping anybody in this country. They're, they're, they're causing more problems than you know. If we look at that embodied energy and all the, money, uh, all the pollution that was spent to make those earlier products, it's, it's 10 times more energy to create modern products with transportation, and emissions from factories. PVC is probably the most, not probably, the top environmental chemist at, at all the universities. In one of my favorite documentaries uh, called Blue Vinyl. Now it's not a porno film, but it's called Blue Vinyl. And you, you should check it out. You can, you, I think you, I don't know if you can get it on Netflix or, or, or wherever, but you go online and you'll find where you can get it. It's a, uh, it's a toxic, uh, jaunt around the world and this young girl um, her parents were going to put blue siding on her house uh, vinyl siding because they lived in a New Jersey neighborhood and everybody else around them had taken their cedar siding off their houses or put vinyl siding over them and they wanted to sell and move to Florida <laughs> and so they figured they had to put on blue siding to do it well this her mother had taken a drug during the 50s that caused a birth defect they, I can never pronounce the name of it. Many of you out there, especially women, will know what I'm talking about. And she had to have a radical hysterectomy when she was like 17 years old and got a settlement out of it. So she took that money to produce this documentary and she took a piece of that blue vinyl siding and went all over the world. She went down to Louisiana and they tested the air and it's just toxic and everybody's dying of cancer. They went to Italy and watched all the executives be uh, 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 on trial for colluding with the American Vinyl Institute to uh, uh, lie to the American public. Um, it's just, you know, the fire chiefs of America are, are estimating that 30 to 40% of the people that die in house fires don't die from getting burned. They don't die from 
from, from smoke inhalation. They die from toxic off gas from PVC, which at 100 and uh, uh, let's see, what is it? Yeah, 160 degrees becomes a toxic plume. And we learned that at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas in the 1980s. There was a fire on one floor and a lot of people died and they died from toxic off gassing from vinyl, PVC, and the carpets, the wallpapers, the doors, all the different elements that were all just laden with PVC. And that's when this whole movement to start to bring PVC into, into the light of, of day. You know, the Chicago plumbers for years wouldn't let PVC drain lines come in because they, they were putting in cast iron. And I, I think there was some of that was, it was more, they made more money putting it in, but I also think that whether they knew it or not, it was a great idea because PVC is really a toxic product, but you know, it's everywhere for drain lines because what are you gonna do, right? So windows are really simple. And uh, they're made with what we call mortise and tenon joints. So this is a tenon, and this is a mortise, and they fit together like this, and you see how that works. And the end of this, where you see the tenon coming through, that's called a full through tenon. It means it goes all the way through, and I hope I'm, I'm getting so that people can see some of this stuff, but it goes all the way through. Now, in a lot of modern wooden windows that are made with finger jointed wood and they're metal clad, the, jo the, the joint only goes in about halfway instead of all the way through like this one. But what that creates is a little pocket for moisture to get into and rot the window sashes. Whereas when it comes all the way through, if moisture gets into the joint anywhere around it, it can evaporate out through the mortise and tenon joint. And we don't glue these joints. We don't glue mortise and tenon joints on exterior elements like windows and doors. We use, in the early years, they used wooden pegs. And today, and then starting about 1900, they started using steel pins and they would just put a steel pin in through here. Now, today, we, uh, when we're restoring windows, we use stainless steel pins because obviously a steel pin rusts over time and we want our work to last. And that's a really good point. You know, we are a throwaway society and we need to stop this nonsense. My father was a, like I said, 610 corporate executive, CEO. He uh, was uh, an old house warrior on the weekends and he was a woodworker. And um, he'd be gone a lot because he had to travel around the world. And when he come home on the weekends, I would do anything to hang out with my dad. I'm saying any. And I'm down in the shop with my dad and he looks at me and he says, you know, Bob, we don't own this house. And I'm like, I beg your pardon. I start crying. I'm like, are we moving? I, uh, you know, he says, no, no, no. Do you love this house? I said, yeah, you took that drywall ceiling off and exposed those beams and the ceiling and French doors and Dutch doors and, and all this neat woodwork and stuff and all these cubby holes for me to hide out and make forts in and all this kind of, uh, you know, I love it, dad. Why, why don't we own it? He said, well, you can go down to the county courthouse and you can give them the address and they will tell you that uh, I own this house. Your mom and I own this house. But don't you ever think you own this house. You are a steward of this house and it's our job to do quality work that lasts so that the next family can enjoy it as much as we have. And when we rip out original windows and put in a, a inferior replacement window, we are saying to the next family, we don't care about you. And that's not a very conservative notion. It's a very conservative notion to take care of what we have. And I know many of you feel that way. Um, and, you know, the, the reality is, is that we have become a throwaway society in so many ways. The other thing about old windows is that they're made with old growth wood. Now I'm going to show you a couple of pieces. and I'm going to try to come in here really close. These are pieces of Douglas fir flooring. These are older growth, very tight grain, straight grain, what we call quarter sawn, um, older growth, really nice. Old growth wood is, according to the, uh, uh, the National Forest Service, uh, they, they do all the research on wood, is any lumber that comes from a tree that's 60 years or older. Now, some of the wood that windows came from 
from the mid 1800s all the way up until the 1930s were hundreds of years old, <clears throat> but we clear cut everything. We literally clear cut this entire country. If you go into the Appalachian Mountains or you go up into the, the north woods of Michigan and, and, and Wisconsin and, and, and Minnesota, what you're gonna find is a lot of trees, but they're not first growth, not that original old growth because we clear cut everything. And so it's very rare to find that kind of wood and it's a precious resource. And if, 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 if we're taking and we're, we're tossing out 56, 60 million old growth window sashes a year, and it used to be closer to a million uh, old growth window sashes uh, or a hundred million, excuse me. Um, it's, just, it's just wasting a resource because this is what you get today. Now here are two examples. One is Doug fir and one is just, just uh, what they call white wood. They won't even tell you what it is. Now the top one has a pretty tight grain, but look at the bottom one. It's just the grain lines are just like three eighths of an inch away from each other. So these, these are tree farm trees. And uh, you know, you can find, this is Doug fir. I go to Lowe's and I buy Doug fir uh, two by twelves, and they have to come from a larger tree, so they're older growth. That's what this came out of, and that's pretty tight grain. Um, but this is just garbage, and will rot away so fast if it's used on an exterior element, especially windows. So it's really important to remember that old growth wood matters, and we don't want to throw it away. <laughs> Uh, okay, so when we're talking about wood, we're talking about how to, how to construct a window with mortise and tenon joints. We're talking about something that can easily be taken out of its opening and it can be repaired and put back into its opening. And if the glass breaks, if, you know, I can always tell, you know, back in a day, the Catholic uh, neighborhoods in cities had huge families. And I can almost, almost always tell if it was a Catholic neighborhood from all the BB holes in the windows because everybody had a daisy BB here in the window. You know, families with eight and 12 kids um, all over. But if you break a window or a baseball goes through it, it's easy to repair a window like that. If this, this, I don't even like to touch this. This is a uh, vinyl window, standard of what you'd see in just about any house. The difference on this one is that if the window was any wider than this, this is a little baby window they would have two sash locks because where the where the, the upper sash and the lower sash meet in the middle are so flimsy that they have to have two sash locks to pull them together because they're so flimsy. But what's interesting about this is that I've not busted the glass out of this, but if you look at the, the, the metal strip that separates the panes of glass, there's a perforation in the metal. And that's because Cardinal Glass, the largest glass manufacturer in the country up in the, uh, in the upper Midwest. They make all the glass of what we call modern flow glass um, that they sell to all the window companies. And they wanted to know how long the seal between the panes of glass lasted. And of course, you know, here, here's my example uh, with, with the uh, insulation in between, but it kind of shows you on the side. So, they, you know, they, they tried single sealants then double and triple in case the first one failed, the second one would take over and the third one, that type of thing. And what they found is that the seals between the panes of glass fail within the first three to six years and condensation gets up in between them. And so that could be an issue um, for, an, I had this one little thing here and I don't know what I did with it, it didn't matter. So what they did is they started to take this metal strip and they started to fill it with a desiccant. Now that's that little bag that comes in your pill bottle. I had one laying here, but I don't know what happened to it. And they put it in there and what that does is absorb moisture. So, you know, and, and they have a lifespan whether they're absorbing moisture or not or somewhere between six to eight years. Um, so if you have, let's give it best case scenario, six years before the seals fail and condensation starts to get in. And then you got another six years where the desiccant that, that's in your little pill bottle is absorbing the moisture. And then you start to see a condensation on a regular basis. And this is epidemic throughout the country uh, that these seals fail and it's just constant. So 
good testing. It was called accelerated testing where they threw sleet and rain and all the kind of weather that, that we have in the upper Midwest at these windows to uh, simulate 20 years, but the windows never got past 12 before they were completely failed. The other uh, type of replacement window that is failing more than any other is what we call metal clad or vinyl clad. Now they're appealing to homeowners because you can get a wood interior on the window sash and then it's metal on the outside, white and brown, and I think you can get beige, real, real fashionable colors, you know? And uh, they don't have to be painted in theory, but if you, look at, if you look at aluminum siding that's 20 years old, you can start to see the aluminum through it because the paint is starting to, to deteriorate on the surface of the aluminum siding. It's the same thing, but you're never gonna to get to that point with a clad window because in eight to 12 years, what's gonna happen is that moisture gets behind the cladding and it rots the sashes. So when we're going around the country looking at clad windows that have been in place eight to 12 years, what we're finding is that sometimes half the sash, half the thickness of the window sash that has metal on the outside, half the thickness is rotted away and you don't even know it. I mean, you come up and hit your elbow on the window when you're messing around in the bushes and the cladding will fall off and cause all kinds of problems. Now, this is just an epidemic problem with replacement windows. All right, so I've talked about replacement windows quite a bit here. And uh, part, of, part of the reason that I want to is so that people understand the underlying reasons why you can make a window as energy efficient, have less air infiltration than replacement windows. What, what the guy that did our testing down in Pine Mountain said was that you, you will never see a replacement window market to air infiltration. They only market to uh, you know, the U value now and the R values before because the, the testing is not very good uh, compared to what we are able to create with a system I'm gonna walk you through here in a little bit. Um, so I, I, I think that's, that, that's important to remember uh, that air infiltration is your number one issue, not thermal windows. You know, I don't care what, what you do, but what's nice about a wood storm is that a wood storm gives you a better air gap between the primary window sash. So if you weather strip the primary double hung and you put a storm, whether it's a, a the new aluminum storms, um, there's a, companies up in Minnesota and down in the Cincinnati area, they all make these extruded aluminum storms that have an air gap in them because the, the typical lumber yard uh, unfinished aluminum storm uh, conducts heat and cold, aluminum conducts heat and cold. Um, and they, they're making some with, with air in the frames. They're very uh, uh, narrow frames, so they're very unobtrusive. Uh, but I still prefer wood storms, especially on bungalows, because I'm willing to bet that most, if not all, of the Chicago, not all, but probably, but most of the Chicago bungalows had a wood storm and a wood screen. Now, people were like, well, okay, but I got to get up and I've got to change the wood storm out for the wood screen every year and it's really a pain. Well, about 30 years ago, I came up with a design and I've shared it and I've never gotten a penny from it, I don't care, with a whole bunch of different people around the country. Uh, and some people have developed their own independently from, from what I developed. And um, it's, it's, it's a wooden storm window. This is a, one that's made by a company in Dubuque, Iowa. And uh, it looks like a traditional screen because this particular one has a, a permanent screen with screen molding on it that holds the screen in place. But you can get them without the permanent screen. And they have removable panels from the inside. So you can get a screen panel and a glass panel so that you have a screen on the top and the bottom. A screen on the top and the bottom is absolutely critical because, you know, listen, I'm a Midwestern fat boy. I love central air conditioning. We have geothermal here at, at the Belvedere School, the 10 ton system. And um, I love central air conditioning. But the truth is, is that if you use your windows and use your old house for airflow, like it was designed, uh, we don't have to turn on our air conditioning. We have guests here until sometimes July. And uh, 
you know, we save a lot of money by doing it and by using your windows, how they were designed, drop the top sash, raise the lower sash and do it the same amount. So if it's six inches down, six inches up, it creates a vortex around the window and takes all the hot air and humidity out the top. Now the aluminum storm window, the lumberyard aluminum storm, of course, that was the downfall of double hung windows in this country. They, they built a prison somewhere in Illinois that they never occupied. And I always thought that the guy that invented uh, aluminum triple track, break your fingers off, not even a good windbreak storms, ought to be in prison because he's such a moron. I don't think there is a prison for morons, but maybe there ought to be a prison for morons because that, what it did is it made everyone forget that their top sash is even operating uh, because there's only a screen on the bottom. It's called a triple track for a reason. So you have glass on the top, glass on the bottom, and a screen on the bottom. And so people just forgot and they painted their top shut, uh, sashes shut and, uh, and that caused all kinds of problems. People quit going out and looking at their windows. Every year, my dad and I would get out in the spring and he had this, what, what he called the 40 foot man killer, which was a, <clears throat> a 40 foot wooden extension ladder. And he rigged up all these pulleys on it and stuff. And I'd go upstairs and I'd take the little hooks and eyes off the glass storms and then he would take a rope and put it through a little hanger at the top. You know, storm windows generally have these kinds of hangers on the top so that, uh, like this, so that uh, you, you can hang the storms. I mean, here's another version of that. And uh, that way you can hang the storm windows. And he would put the, uh, the rope through it and he would wheel it down on the pulley to me and then we'd put it off to the side, we'd clean them and he had a little rack that he put them in. And we'd take the screens and we'd hose off the screens and dry them off and, and we'd put those up. It was a ritual. It was something that we did every year. And people's lives are busy and I understand that. Um, but it, it forced us to look at the window opening every year. And if there was a problem, if there was paint peeling or what have you, we could take care of that problem. And then we wouldn't get the rot that we see so much in windows where they put these aluminum storms on. Now they're better than nothing because they create a windbreak. But this window sash is a, a treasure. Now th this one is for a uh, four light, four lights, four panes of glass. Uh, our house here at the Belvedere is six over six, which is a classic Robert Adam designed window that came from England. And glass was very expensive. And so you get, you know, the wavy glass uh, or what we call cylinder glass in most of these where, where they blew a big cylinder <laughs> and then they slid it down the middle and laid it down and it's uneven and one edge is fatter than another. And no, glass does not sag over time. I used to think that too. And what I found out from a chemist is that while glass is technically liquid, it, it never sags. There's not enough of movement in it for it to get thicker at the bottom. It's just the way it was made back in the day. But the, so you've got these fabulous, you know, divided light windows and there is no way you can get the texture and the depth of these muntins. These are called muntins. And a muntin, some people call them mullions, but that's incorrect, it's M-U-N-T-I-N-S. These are called muntins, and they divide the panes of glass. And uh, they're beautiful. Um, and until uh, later in the, in the, in the uh, uh, 19th century, late 1800s, when they were able to create larger pieces of glass, most of the houses had multiple pane, uh, multiple pane glass, uh, divided light windows. And then they started to go to one over ones. And then the arts and crafts movement was into, uh, you know, kind of this, you know, the interest of that. So you would see them coming back again, like four over one or six over one, those kinds of things, or sometimes uh, divided lights on both window sashes. Um, so the, the way the window sashes in an old house operate is, 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 is with a counterweight system. This is a pulley. This is a piece of rope, uh, or this is a sash weight, and this is a pulley. Now this is a cast pulley, and uh, it, it's a nice one. This is a small weight, this is just a three pound weight. 
And we use, uh, in most windows and residential houses, we use a sash cord um, that is called the number eight. It's a quarter inch diameter. And there's a lot of different companies that make it. Um, for a long time, we were using sash cord that was nylon and because we, you know, it, was, it seemed stronger than, uh, than cotton and it seemed not to flex as much. But what we've learned over the years is that uh, that cotton sash cord lasts longer than nylon sash cord. Now, nylon sash cord is made entirely with oil, uh, petroleum, and chemicals uh, all derived from a petroleum. It's plastic in a sense. Um, and I was thrilled to find this out that you could get another 10 years out of a cotton sash cord than you could out of, out of uh, a nylon until I realized that it actually cotton sash cord uses more energy uh, than, than making nylon um, because uh, cotton uh, uh, farming is one of the most energy uh, intense crops in the world. Um, so what we do now is we're using one uh, that has, and I don't know if you could see that or not, but there's a piece of nylon coming out of the middle of the cotton sash cord. So we get the longevity from the UV light of the cotton with the strength of the nylon in, in the middle of it. And this is the type of cord that the majority of people in the business are using today. Um, and if you don't get paint on it, it will last a long, long time. If you get paint on your sash cords, it becomes brittle and will go away very, very quickly. So in, in a double hung window, this happens to be a top sash. And then of course you have one underneath. Well, what you have is on the sides of the window sashes, you have an air infiltration area. So air can come in. And many Chicago bungalows actually have this system retrofitted into it. This is actually called the Dorbin Metal Track System. Dorbin Metal Tracks is based in Chicago and they sell to Killian Hardware, which is another big online place where consumers can buy it, but they manufacture this and it's a rib track system. And this is the track. And what, what's fun about it is that the track goes in the slot and it moves up and down like this. And so I'm gonna show you a different piece here. Um, this is just a little mock-up of one of those convertible storms. We have a slot beside of it, but you can see, I think a little bit better, how that track goes into that slot and creates a situation so the air can't will come in, it can't get around that rib, down the other side and come in. So it stops all the air infiltration on the sides. Now our house here in Hannibal was built in 1859. In 1893, it was retrofitted with that system, and uh, which is very early. And I'm gonna show you a piece of the track. So here's, here's the modern track. And here's a piece of the original turn metal track that came out of this house. And we were able to take this out. Now they nailed this in in the old days, even in the arts and crafts era, 1900, 1930. And they nailed it in and with tons and tons of nails and, and it's just absurd. So we take it off and then we drill holes, you know, three or four holes in it right down the wide side like this. And we screw it onto the jam. That way it's easy to get on and off and we don't have all these nails that will bend it and it'll last longer and it's more sustainable that way. So if you take an 1859 house and you put this system into it with a rib track like this in 1893 and, and this weird guy named Bob comes along and takes all the windows out to restore them, takes this track out, puts some steel wool on it, puts it back in and the windows just operate with this track with one finger even with the weights. And I think that surprises a lot of people, but the truth is, is that, that because this is zinc and it has, it's very smooth, the windows go up and down. Literally it's a, it's one finger operation. And, you know, people are struggling to get their windows up and that kind of thing it, that takes the problem away. And that's critical. Now, the other part of it is, is that where the top sash goes up at the, at the top of what we call the jam, which is the frame the window sits in. They used to have a piece of this up on top of here. Well, we've changed that because 
we're now using a piece of rubber at the top. You can, I think you can see that piece of rubber. It's in a slot, it's friction fit in. So at the top of the sash, that's another air infiltration area. So now we stopped it on the sides with the track top and bottom sash. The top sash has a piece of rubber at the top, but it also has a piece of rubber at the meeting ring. And the meeting rail is where the two sashes meet and the sash lock closes. Lots of air infiltration in there. And, and this is a, a hollow tube. I'll show you a piece in just a second. Uh, uh, weather stripping that friction fits. It's nice and it's nice and snug in there. And if, it, if something happened to it, you could give it a really hard tug and it'll come out and you can replace it. So it's repairable. I keep going back to repairable. Um, and I think that's really important. And the bottom rail on the bottom sash, the one you lift up and down the most, another air infiltration spot, and we put a rubber gasket in there. Now, here's a piece of uh, two different styles of the rubber gasket material that we use. And one is a larger tube than the other. And they both, uh, they're hollow tube, and they have these little flanges that friction fit in the slots which is nice. And it's really easy to do the slots. So the slots, the only electric tools, I only use a router and I use infrared heating devices from Sweden that I'm gonna go into in a minute. But this is a router and this, I just spilled my coffee all over everything. Okay. So this is a, a slotting bit right here. And it, it, it has a big roller bearing here and it goes around and it slots the slot in the side of the window sash. And that's 530 seconds inch uh, makes a hole because the rib is an eighth and you need a 30 second inch more than the thickness of the of that little rib in, in the track. And then this is a very thin 330 seconds inch uh, uh, router bit, slotting bit. And it that's the slot for the, um, for the rubber gasket material. Now I'm going to try to keep, get all the coffee off of everything because, you know, this, this is live, man. Anyway, thank goodness for rags, huh? So bottom line is, is that we can take a window sash like I showed you, and we can make that window sash so it doesn't have air infiltration coming in at the top, the bottom, or anywhere else. And that's a critical aspect of making a window so that it's energy efficient. Um, now, if you want to, get, if you're buying into the thermal capability, oh, there we go, I got it done, all right. If you're buying into the thermal capability, a storm, eh? if they understand that we all kind of understand that an air gap, it has insulated quality. Most people understand that. Uh, and it does up into about two and three quarter, three inches, then it starts to get less and less and less. So the gap between the primary window sashes and the storm is about two and a half to three inches at the most, and even uh, a little bit less than that on the upper sash between the storm. And so you actually have a better air gap than a piece of insulated glass. Uh, well, we can't call it that, right? What are we calling it? We're calling it double pane because it can't be insulated unless it has insulation in it. Um, the, uh, and so we get a better air gap. So we're getting a, a, a U value that's significant, that, that's uh, as cl close to what we see with a, um, with a triple pane argon gas, you know, uh, low E coatings. I'm not a fan of low E coatings. Sometimes I do retrofit something different into my storms rather than just single or double strength glass. I will put a quarter inch laminated glass. Into them. Um, there was a study uh, done by Walter Sedevac, who's uh, an architect out in New York City, um, who looked at insulated glass as compared to uh, double pane glass. And while it doesn't have the same thermal capability, it's better than, than, uh, than double or single strength glass, which most of your windows have. Uh, it's safety glass, of course, the same thing that's in your windshield, your car windows. Um, and it has the, the mylar that's sandwiched in between the two pieces of glass. That's why they, uh, they call it laminated glass. 
has 99 plus percent UV protection with none of that dark low E coatings whatsoever. And, um, and it's more soundproof than, than double pane glass and it's cheaper than double pane glass units to retrofit. So we never take the primary sashes and we never retrofit double pane glass into them because it, it violates thousands of years of woodworking knowledge, which is that if you take a router and you, may, and you have to route out deep enough to be able to set this piece of glass into this window, you're going to be routing into the mortise and tenon joints and you're going to weaken that sash. We see this in commercial buildings a lot. So there'll be a tax credit, uh, a historic tax credit on a commercial building and they'll go in, the park service allows it at some level to go in and retrofit thicker uh, window sashes in old buildings uh, with double pane glass. Um, so in, in, in the window standards, we love the park service because they help fund this. And we and I work with them a lot. I've trained a lot of their, their preservation people out in the field. Um, the, we disagree. We think that routing out those old windows makes them so that they'll fall apart if they're ever really operating. And we have to start thinking about this from a climate change standpoint. I mean, uh, are we gonna continue to be able to have central air conditioning or are we gonna eventually have to go back to using our buildings the way they were designed for airflow? Um, you know, I, it's kind of tough. You know, we live in the upper Midwest. I live in, you know, when it's 96 here, in Hannibal, the humidity is 96. I, I mean, they, they, it's, it's very humid here. But honestly, if we use this house the way it was designed, it, the airflow is so good that it's actually comfortable and takes all that humidity out of the house. We just have to remember how to use our houses with a transom windows over the door so air can flow from room to room, dropping our top sash, opening our bottom sash, doing those kinds of things. Now, I mentioned before, uh, you know, one of the things that really freaks a lot of people out about old windows is lead paint. Well, you know, I, I like to grind it up and put it in my cereal in the morning. Uh, that's not true. In fact, uh, you have to be careful with lead paint. It's not a joke, especially with little kids. Now, I've been doing this all my life. My doc doctor says, you are considered a lead worker, Bob. And I'm like, what the hell does that mean? He says, well... People that work around lead all the time, lead mines, lead paint, that kind of thing, you're considered a lead worker and you can have a level of 2025. 20, I said, well, that's stroke time. You know, that's off the Richter scale. Uh, I have a friend named Duffy Hoffman, a colleague, actually, I should say, and he, uh, he got dosed at 60, 70, and he had several strokes, and it's been a nightmare for him. And it wasn't his fault. He was working on a project where the other car, he was being lead safe and the other contractor was belt sanding paint off of woodwork and his fans pulled it in and got really sick. You can get sick, but I've been tested every year of my life. My kids, I was a single father raising my kids on my own uh, from the time they were little babies and they lived, in, we camped out in every house I bought and we, I would cordon off one room and I would do all my lead removal in that room. I'd have plastic on each side of the door jam with offset slots. I'd have an exhaust fan. I'd wear my, you know, I I'd wear really crappy old clothes. I wear my respirator. Uh, everybody should, in the world that has an old house should have a respirator with the pink filters that's rated for lead. This is the most comfortable for me. It's a smaller one. And uh, they're available at any of the paint stores or, you know, uh, the lumber yards, and you should have one, and you should wear it whenever you're working around old paint. Um, so I've been tested, and I've never had a level over nine. Now, that you know, the average uh, male in this country has a level of somewhere between uh, three and a half and seven, and that's just from the environment around us. Um, so uh, an eight or nine, which is what I run, is considered extremely low for somebody that's around it all the time. Um, it's interesting, though, uh, if they do test you as an adult in Illinois or Missouri or Iowa, where I'm from, uh, they report it to the state. 
So one day my lead, lead level, one, one year it went up from eight to eight and a half. And uh, one of the women that work at the end came running down into the woodworking shop. She's like, Bob, you gotta come upstairs. I'm like, what's going on? She's like, there's somebody from HUD, OSHA, and the EPA, and they have a no knock warrant and they're sitting in the living room. And I'm like, whoa, that's interesting. So I went up and I said, can I help you? And they said, yes, we're here to interview your employee that had the half a point rise in his uh, lead level in his blood. And I said, well, that would be me. <laughs> and they said, oh, well, you're the owner. I said, yeah. I said, how do you know that? They said, well, it gets reported. I didn't know this. I understand why they reported our kids, but I was really kind of shocked that they reported to the state uh, for adults. And so I sat down and talked to them. I'm certified in everything around lead. And they got up 45 minutes later and said, well, you know more about lead safety than we do. Have a great day. So yeah, and they left. So that was a bit of a shocker. But that was okay. I didn't mind them coming by. Um, it's how it works. So lead is not as big a deal as people make it out to be. I mean, lead has been around a long time. So here's Dutch boy. A Dutch boy, you know, they had these white lead, strictly pure wars between Dutch boy and Sherwin Williams. And this is Carter. Uh, our white lead is strictly pure. I mean, they, they just had, you know, it's kind of like the guy that started coming to our preservation conferences uh, from Sweden a few years back. And uh, he said, you know, my, my paint and my putty is pure linseed. It's so pure, you can eat it. And he sat there eating the putty during the conference. And I thought to myself, wow, that's sort of like Chevron saying they're green. Come on, that's crazy. You know, don't be eating your putty, guy. You get sick. Uh, so lead paint, and 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 in fact, uh, finally in in California, um, the um, uh, Sherwin Williams got nailed for uh, lead paint um, in in a lawsuit. I, I think it was a class action that finally, you know, there was been a, a lot of them ramping up, and, and finally one of them lost because they all knew. We've known for thousands of years that lead is not good for people. And, um, and they all knew it wasn't good for people either. The, the, the sad thing about it is, is that paint, the higher the solid content, the better the paint. Now, if they're proprietary things. They won't tell you what those solid contents are, the resins and all kinds of things. And you always want your paint to be uh, well above 50% solid content. Uh, but, you know, solid, met, you know, heavy metal like lead was a really serious <laughs> solid content and the paint lasted a long time. But it's really not that hard to take off. Um, now, I, I've tried all different kinds of ways with, with, with uh, uh, wood windows to get the lead off. And what I found is that one of the ways is steam. So some of, there's some people in our business that use steam boxes and they look like big pizza ovens. And you can stick a couple of sashes in and it steams the putty in the paint. You take it out and you take the putty out and then you have to put it back in the steam box to re-steam it to get the paint off most of the time. And I tried one for a couple of years. And what I don't like about it is that it, it infuses a lot of moisture into the wood and it fuzzes the wood up. And I don't really sand window sashes because when I'm removing paint after the paint is off and, I, and I'm detailing, uh, I use a carbide scraper, and that's a carbide scraper that comes, you can buy those at Lowe's or any of the big box lumber yards or two sided blades. I shave my legs with them. No, I'm kidding. But uh, you could shave your legs with them, they're that sharp. But we never dry scrape. This is called water. It's an old fashioned thing that we call water. And we actually mist the old wood after we've got the majority of the old paint off uh, using the infrared heaters, which I'll show you in a second. Then we miss the wood and we and we detail and get the rest of the residue off of this. So steam actually puts the lead residue into the wood. It doesn't pull it out. So that's another issue because HUD, you know, pitches a fit. Uh, you know, they just assume pull out all the original windows, all the siding, all the trim, and put it all new. We're starting to work with HUD and they're starting to come around in many ways. Um, but in the testing that I've seen. Infrared heaters, this is called a, a speed heater. It's an infrared heating device that's uh, designed, I, you know, first saw them in Sweden. And, you know, you gotta, you gotta give the Europeans credit because they come up with things that really work. 
Um, heat guns are not, this is not a heat gun as, as you would think of a heat gun. Heat guns are like, you know, 700 to 1200 degrees. They vaporize lead paint in a heartbeat. And uh, lead paint becomes a toxic vapor at 640 degrees. This, this device used according to the manufacturer's recommendations uh, doesn't heat the paint over 540 degrees. And it actually heats the resin in the wood and a tiny, tiny fraction of it will vaporize underneath the paint and lift the paint film off the, the molding profiles and everything. It even heats uh, the putty to the point where we can take the putty out real quickly. Um, and we're using what's called a roller chisel. Now, this is kind of an interesting tool. I'm gonna to bring it in a little closer. This time I won't spill my coffee. We still have some left. This is called a roller chisel and it's got, it has literally has a little roller right here. So when you're taking the putty out, the roller goes along the wood side and it makes it so you can control it because everybody hacks into the edges when they're trying to take putty out. So we, we heat the putty and the flat on the paint and we hit the putty first. And then we come in after the putty comes out and we take a, what's called a hook shave. And this is a, 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 a big blade because the volume of paint that comes off with an infrared heating device is huge. And the blade on a carbide scraper is not deep enough to be able to even come close to accommodating the amount of paint that it takes off. And then we back it up with a HEPA vac or a HEPA filtered vac. That's a vac as an acronym for a vacuum that takes dust in and, and, and paint particles and all the paint that you've done and puts virtually none of it back out into the air. That's very important that you should, everyone, uh, every old house owner should have a HEPA, H-E-P-A rated vac so that they can keep themselves safe. Now, I, I talked a little bit about windows being painted in and they do get painted in. And this is uh, not a Gothic torture tool. And this is not a, uh, anything that, you know, other than it's called a window zipper. And it's designed to cut paint lines. So if this upper sash was painted shut, I can take this like this along the side and it cuts the paint line on both sides of the window sash. And we do 99% of all of our window restoration work from the inside of the house. We rarely ever have to get up, unless we're doing wood storms and we have to get up to hang those. But uh, so window zipper works really well and it can free up that painted shut top sash because that's usually the one that's painted in the most. And sometimes they'll even be, be uh, um, uh, silicone caulked in or what have you because part of HUD's big weatherization program was going in with silicone caulk and caulking windows shut. And, and many of you that have done this kind of work know what I'm talking about. And it's crazy. And a heat gun set on a, on a medium low setting will actually warm that up enough that it, it, it will uh, come off without affecting the, uh, the lead paint. So lead paint's been around a long time. And um, it, it, it's, it's an issue if you're not careful. So what I used to do with the kids, I would do both sides of the doorway, offset slits, exhaust fan. At the end of the day, this was before Tyvek suits, which is a, a suit with a hood and, and footies like in your jammies when you were a kid and, and uh, protect your clothes from getting lead dust on them. But back in the day, we didn't have, we didn't have them. And they probably existed, but we didn't know about them. And so I would, I would strip down at the end of the day to my boxer shorts put all my clothes in a garbage bag and then take them down to the laundry. Well, one day I got arrested for doing that because I, this house had an exterior basement entrance and uh, I, I stripped down to my boxers. I had my bag over my shoulder. I climbed out the window and the old lady next door called the cops and said, there's some old pervert in his boxer shorts walking through the backyard. So I got in a cop car and they're like, they ended up not arresting me because they realized who I was and what I was doing. But, it's a bit of a, of a challenge for a moment, to say the least. Now, the other thing that we find sometimes, but not very often, old growth wood uh, tends to not get rotted too badly, but if they're, if they're cocked shut and, 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 and you've got underlying issues, you don't have a storm, the storm protects the window sashes. Uh, it's absolutely critical. You know, 
in the beginning of old windows, original windows in this country and in England, the way we protected windows was with shutters. Now you had to be a weather person, right? You had to figure out if the weather was coming, you had to get out and shut the shutters, it's kind of a pain. Then the window ended, once the industrial revolution came up, we figured out ways to make uh, large sheets of screening and larger glass. The window, uh, uh, the storm window companies were saying, save 30% on fuel costs, install wood storms. They were saying the same thing about the track system, save 30% on coal costs, install this uh, weather stripping system. And you know, they didn't have any science behind any of that, but they were closer to, uh, to the truth than, than, than they knew, that is for sure. So in 2011, I'm gonna go back to, to the window industry just for a second here. In 2011, the Federal Trade Commission went after all these big window companies and said, you are committing fraud. You're saying that you can save 30, 40, 50, and 60% on energy costs, and it's a lie. And we've never seen any testing over 10%. And you can't produce any testing that shows that your numbers are correct. So if you don't stop claiming energy, uh, thermal energy savings, we're going to come back after you. So, I mean, the data is out there. And then you also have to remember what the what the uh, Department of Energy has said all along, which is windows, an old rattly window, putty falling out, ropes broken, crummy, uh, unpainted aluminum lumberyard storm in a building, an entire house. Of the 100% of the energy use that you use in your house, it only, that only makes up 10%. 10% is sort of insignificant to start with uh, until you stop the air infiltration, which is the only issue with windows. And once you do that, you're looking at, you know, down in the four to six uh, percent range out of 100% of your utility costs. Doors use 11% on average. All your electronics use 14 to 16%. Uh, you know, there are all these different appliances and, and, and and not having your, your wiring holes caulked and your plumbing holes plugged up and not having enough insulation in the attic, all these kinds of things make a big difference. So bottom line is uh, the rot, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna end it on that. We, a, a couple quick things. This is called Sarco Putty. This is made in Chicago because everything good is made in Chicago or the upper Midwest. The Sarco Putty Company, Amy Sarco has sort of taken over the uh, marketing for the company because you know the, the men in her family you'd call them up and they go yeah what do you want when they answer the phone Amy's lovely and she's really helped the company this is the go-to putty this is type m that for wood windows um, that we use in the industry it's a boil linseed oil putty it's very it, it's creamy it does a great job don't ever use dap because dap is crap if you paint dap before 28 days it will fail if you don't paint DAP in 28 days, it will fail. And you can't paint it for 28 days because it doesn't skin over. It's just a terrible product. It's been on the shelves forever. There was another one called Glazol that was made by UGL that was actually a very good glazing putty. And you could add a little bit of boiled linseed oil to it, but Glazol, UGL just told me they're quitting making it because they can't compete with DAP. But Sarko, Amy, and her family are competing with DAP, and they're doing a great job the better the putty, this skins over in two or three days, so you can paint it. You don't have to wait 28 days. Um, and getting things painted is important. Uh, and you don't want to leave them unpainted for any period of time either, because putty will fail. I don't care what kind of putty it is if you put it in and you don't paint it. So that's very important. Rot. I'll show you this. So this is the bottom of a baluster that came off of a balcony of a Tudor, uh, off of a Tudor, uh, uh, master bedroom onto the roof of a solarium and there were 200 of these and these are made out of cypress and they sat like this and the bottom rail had come down and water was coming down and coming up and sucking up into the end grain and when we pulled these all off I could literally stick my finger all the way up into this now we used Abitron, and this is a, the go-to uh, epoxy that we use, and there's A and B for the liquid, and we soak the end of this with the liquid epoxy 
and it reconsolidated the rod. There's no rod in on, on it anymore. And then we took the putty, which is this, and this is Abitron's wood epox, and it comes in A and B as well. And you mix them. The nice thing about the liquid and the wood, you can't use the, the, the wood epox without the liquids. The liquid's like a primer. And the nice thing about it is, is that they're 50-50. So you make a ball of A and B, and you put it together, it's like a Play-Doh. And then you mix equal amounts of the liquid and you pour it into the rot and you can go right in with the putty. And so we were able to take this and fix the bottom of it so that it has, uh, you know, uh, an, another 100 year life. And what we've, what we've learned is that when you do a patch on the bottom, you need to drill weep holes in the bottom which is what we've done at the bottom of this, so that if any moisture gets on top, it can wick through the putty and get out the bottom. Now, the only failures we ever saw is when we didn't do the weep holes in this. It's a really good one. There's another one called West Systems that does a really good job, but you have to put it in and you can't shape it. This stuff you can shape and, uh, you know, this is a ball of it because my students always make too much of it. Um, and uh, you, you can shape it with a chisel, with a sander, with, you know, any, any way you want, just like wood, it shaves off with wood shavings, look like wood shavings, it's fantastic stuff, and it can re repair the rot. So, old windows aren't a pain, they're a gold mine. Now, we have questions, and Carla wants to go with that, let's do that. All right, will do. Um, there's some really great ones we have. So, um, uh, one of them I wanted to start with, um, which I'd answered, a couple people wrote in and I answered um, a little bit, but I wanted to see if you could elaborate. They want to know good resources for kind of like, like a step-by-step -step how to. So I mentioned the National Park Service Preservation Brief number nine on restoring windows, but it is like an old brief. It's old. It's old. So this gives best practices and this is tw about 28 bucks plus shipping from Amazon. And it's a, we're not for profit. Uh, John Leake and I uh, are the co-editors of this for the, for the organization. So this gives a lot of information about weather stripping and that kind of thing. So that's a good one. It's not necessarily a blow by blow, but it's best practices and standards. So these are the three books that I recommend. So this is Working Wood Windows. This is a nice book. And this is written by Terry Meany. It's a good one. Another one is my buddy Steve Jordan came out with the Sash Bible. And the Sash Bible is just fabulous. Steve is, is, is one of my favorite guys in the business. He's been around forever. And he's on social media like crazy because he's sort of retired. And then John Leak, my buddy, Save, uh, Save America's Windows. This is his book. And that's excellent. And if you want a book that explains how your house works with airflow and all the systems in it, I recommend this book. <laughs> this is my book that I wrote in the 90s. It's out of print, so you can buy it for about three bucks on Amazon. But it goes into the whole uh, uh, house, houses work, how airflow works, and how all the systems in your house. It's a great treatise on how to take care of an old house. So that, those are the, the go-to books that I would say uh, resources. Also the Craftsman blog, um, uh, which is, um, uh, no, I got to think of his name. Can you help me? Do you remember this, Carl? Uh, the Craftsman blog, just look it up. A Craftsman blog, he's down in Florida and he does a fantastic job um, uh, doing all kinds of blog things. You could also go, to About Your House with Bob Yap on YouTube. Uh, that's my YouTube channel. I own my show from PBS and I've got about half, about well, about a third of the shows up on, on that site now. And um, if you, you can go to bobyap.com, B-O-B-Y-A-P-P, -P, and, and it'll give you a link to the blog plus, or, or to the YouTube channel. Plus there's a blog there that talks about a lot of this stuff and resources and that kind of thing. And then Carla, I'm going to, send to you guys a handout that's just huge. Uh, and you can go through and put it up on your site or do whatever you want with it because I'm, I, I, I want to share it with all, all the folks in Chicago. It also gives resources for materials 
and where to get the tools and stuff. And, 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 and I'm in a unique position, Carla, because I, I left PBS because they wanted me to take free products and I refused. Uh, my client is the consumers of old houses and buildings. And I need to be able to do the testing and I need to be able to decide what's going to, there's a lot of infrared devices on the market out there, but the uh, speed heater company makes the safest UL listed and the best ones. And so I can say that I don't have to pull any punches because nobody's paying me to do so. Yeah. And that, so you're going to send, it's a, you're going to send us a PDF. I'm going to send you a Dropbox. Drop it's so big. It has to want to drive. It's, it's, it's a PDF on a Dropbox. I was going to see, we might be able to upload it with a link, like to a link, um, you know, where um, everyone who attended tonight, we do, we always do a follow-up email and if there's any additional resources. So we might be able to uh, convert that into a link of some sort. Otherwise, we'll let you guys know where to find it um, as well. Uh, if we could put it up on our, our website or something like that too. Um, uh, you answered like 13 questions in one. So that's perfect. <laughs> uh, just so people know. So the book that Bob was holding up about airflow it was a little bit blurry when you were holding it up, but it's called About Your House with Bob Yeah. So um, yeah, About Your House, just in case you guys couldn't read that, um, which is also the name of your YouTube channel. So, um, and YouTube videos are like the best way in terms of restoring windows, honestly, too. Um, somebody also asked in here about, speaking of materials. Oh, oh the Craftsman, the Craftsman blog, the Craftsman blog, the Craftsman blog is Scott Sidler. And uh, he's a young guy that's doing great work out there. So. Okay. Um, okay, let me just, I'll just start this here. So this is a great question because um, it's kind of the sticking point for why people rip these out. Um, so what indications do you see when a window is too far gone to repair? It's a good question. I've never replaced a window. I've never, I've never found one so far gone. It couldn't be saved. Now for the average homeowner, I'm, I'm, I'm a hardcore furniture maker, woodworker, right? So I can make new rails. I can do Dutchman repairs, which is patching a piece of wood on where there's rot. But if you have more than two mortise and tenon joints, and if you remember me showing you that, that's this joint. If this part is rotted away, sometimes I say, that, that for most consumers, that's probably the point. If you have two of these completely rotted off, that sometimes uh, a replacement can be good. But there's no reason to go to these big, gigantic companies. There are regional woodworking companies all over the country and all over Chicago. There are regional companies that can compete price-wise with the bigger companies, but they use older growth wood. They use full through mortise and tenon joints instead of half blinds. It's just more traditional uh, construction. They, they can use all different kinds of pulleys. I mean, we have this kind of pulley, but there's also this pulley, which is made by the Pullman Company. And this has a tape, if I can get the, let's see if I can get this out of here. This is a tape balance. There's a tape, and this is an old one, so we replaced it. But the, this screws into the side of your sash, and there's no, there's no weight problem. And um, it looks like a pulley. And this has a tape on a large spring inside here that's rated for the weight of your sash. So all the sash weights in the world are half the weight of the window sash. So this is a three pound wind weight. So that window sash was a six pound window sash. So uh, that's important. So if you add a weight to a sash, you can buy these add-ons that just slip over the rope that have a hole on them and that kind of thing. That's the point when I would say that a window, you can consider getting a new one. And I would say too, all the contractors I know in Chicago go through our alleys. Anytime they see a window, they see like a, like a window replacement sign in the front yard. They go around back to the alley and they take all the windows that have been ripped out and then they rip off you know what I mean? Those pieces. I mean, they take the whole window. So, so I have I have two 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 car garages out in back of here that are filled to the rafters with window sashes from the vinyl pirates, and they love me because they don't have to take them to the dump. They just drop them off on the back of my garage, and I get the old wavy cylinder glass. I get authentic old growth wood to make new parts. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and also, you know, I know that somebody else on the, this thread also asks about um, sashes, like there's, or not sashes, I'm sorry, sills. There's like deep, you know, missing parts of sills. And you can really just use wood putty for that, right? And just- You can use, uh, you know, we don't want to be, we don't want to be what I call putty goobers, which is that gigantic ball. <laughs> you know, you don't want to use like, <laughs> right? You, so if I have a, a rod on the edge of a sill, that's, you know, coming in, you know, 20% of the sill, I will cut that off at an angle and put a piece of old growth wood on there and then fill the gaps if I have to with the putty. I don't use, we don't use architectural putty like some sort of structural thing, because it's not. But some sills get what we call grain checks. They're just little checks that have come where, where the weather has eaten away the soft pith between the hard grain line. And we take a razor blade and we back cut those and then we fill them with the architectural liquid epoxy and then the putty. And uh, we've been doing that for years and it really works well. And that can be a way to save an old sill that looks like it maybe can't be saved. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and just to remind people, um, we're not probably going to get through all these questions. We, we, we're going to stop at 8 p.m. tonight. Um, so I know people keep writing in, but you might uh, have yours answered along the way here. So just be uh, aware of that. Um, okay. Um, Okay, so um, are there any, do you know of any resources that can show you how to maximize airflow? Everybody's really excited about the drop the top sash thing in this thread too. So, um, and I know I've seen some old guides that used to show, I mean, they're, you know, like Lord knows where I saw them and studying, you know, but do you have any recs, recs on that? Well, so, so I'll give you an example of our house. We have a Belvedere. A Belvedere is a room on an Italian eight house that juts out of the center of the, of the roof. That's called a Belvedere and it means beautiful view. And it had windows. And so you'd open up the windows and the air would just come flying through the house out through the roof. And that's just huge. Some people have whole house fans. A lot of the, the, the Chicago bungalows uh, had the whole house fans. Those big, uh, they were almost like the propeller on an airplane, <laughs> but boy, they would move the air through those houses like crazy. Uh, having screen doors, I think, are important front and back for cross ventilation. And I, I always mm -hmm. like to consider that in, in each room, uh, as much as you possibly can, you want as much cross ventilation as you can. Now, Chicago bungalows are, are, are sort of shotgunny the way that they're designed. So it's a little bit difficult. But from the front to the back, if you have screen doors that you can open and keep locked, uh, that can make the airflow through. You know, security is an issue. Right, and I understand that in, in urban environments, but you know, what, one of the things that I found out a long time ago doing some research is that crime rates in neighborhoods where they were closing in the front porches rose right along with those closing ends of those porches. So as we saw flight coming out of the central city, going into the near burbs, and they're building mini ranches and they've got patios in the back and decks in the back. The people that were left in the central city are like, oh, we're not second class citizens. We're going to build a deck on the back. We're going to close in our porch for more space. And then people quit sitting on their porches and, with the screen door and they weren't watching. Oh, there's Johnny. I know your parents, John. You know, you know, I'm going to, you know, that, that all went away. That all went away. It's a small part of it. But yeah. it is a piece of it. So. Yeah, um, and I think too there are. I think that there's um, honestly, you know, in terms of like how to get, because you can be like, you know, in the southeast corner, drop your top sash, and then in the northeast corner, drop open your bottom sash. There's stuff you can Google online. I know I did this at some point. It, it depends on the prevailing. <laughs> you know? It depends on the prevailing winds and, and the yeah. area. Yeah. Some areas in Chicago have different winds coming from different yeah. areas. Sure. You just kind of have to look at the prevailing winds and try to get cross ventilation that's really what you're looking mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. um okay how do you fix a top sash that slips down whenever the lock is disengaged it doesn't allow me to only open it partially one of two things is happening either the sash rope is, is off on one side or the weights are under weight so maybe somebody put in a little thicker glass in the top sash and now the weights are not heavy enough to keep the counterbalance so you can go to Killian uh, Hardware online and they sell these, these weight add-ons so that you can add, a, I think they come in a half pound and pound and you just add it onto the top of the weight and that will uh, give you the right uh, counterbalance that you need. Okay. 
Um, my home has windows, we have a couple of these. Um, basically my home has windows from the 1880s that are single hung. Can these be retrofit to double hung? We don't have good air circulation. I assume this is in part as you described because they're, they were not able to get a vortex effect. Right, so if, there, if there's just one big window sash and an opening, you're gonna have a hard time, but it, it also depends. So in our house, we the front windows are one sash, but they pocket up into the brick wall. That's mm -hmm. called a walkout window. So it's a little different animal, but in a bungalow or an 1880s Victorian era house, I don't know what style it is. Uh, it would be really unusual to have original windows that were just one window in an entire opening, unless it's really small. So yes, you can retrofit double hung windows into a larger opening that has a single hung window, but a single hung, you know, one window is, would have to pocket up into the wall above in order to, to even operate. So it's an interesting question. I don't know if I answered yeah, it. Yeah, there was another one that was like, same, same thing, like wanting to make a single hung, uh, you know, into a double hung. Um, and I don't know if in that case it was had been replaced into a fixed window, which often happens on bungalows. That often happens, yeah. Um, and in that case, there's not a way to retrofit it. You just have to replace it. And Well, you know, but the jam or the frame that the old window went up and down in and, and replaced windows often is still there. Mm -hmm. And so the weight pockets are usually there too. Sometimes they fill them with insulation. I can't tell you how many times we've had to, to get wires with hooks on them to get all the foam <laughs> insulation out of window pockets. Uh, but it's not an air infiltration spot. So if you're caulking the outside of your house, your casings, the trim around the exterior of your windows, and you're doing a good caulking job on your paint job, you're not going to get air infiltration in through that weight pocket. That's another big fallacy that just isn't true. Um, yeah, and, and similarly to somebody asked, they, they have their homeowners who already replaced some of the windows in their homes, um, but not their front windows. They seem to have some regrets about it, um, but uh, they, a um, couple people, I guess, people asking about basically how, what do you do if you want them to go back? Like, do you know of any cases where people have gone back to original windows? Absolutely. Like, yeah. Yeah, so, so salvage windows are an option. They're, they're, I mean, it's amazing how, I think that all of the window sashes on eBay are being sold to artists to paint on the glass. I don't yeah. think they're actually being <laughs> yeah. used for windows, but there's thousands of them on, on eBay. Especially and Chicago. Our alleys are literally full of them. Filled with them. System is just and, and, and a lot of the window sashes in the Chicago bungalows came from similar manufacturers within the community when they were built and are, are probably the window openings have a lot of similarities so they could be retrofitted into old windows. Or you can go to a regional millwork company like Dubuque Sash, Dubuque, uh, which is on the Mississippi uh, uh, in, on the uh, Western portion, just over the, to the Iowa border. They've been around since the 1850s and they have molding profiles for every single sash made in this country from the early 1800s on. And they do traditional joinery and they use older growth wood. And, uh, but there's other ones around the Chicago area as well. And I just don't know exactly who they are off the top of my head, but, but you can have them made and it's not going to be that much more. You know, one of the most expensive windows you can buy is a wood window that's clad with aluminum. Those are expensive. And you can buy a wood window with no cladding from the same companies with single pane, which drops the price even down. Well, I, I, I once, I, I've had houses that were missing windows. So I've had to either make them and when I was really young, when Marvin first came around, I had Marvin, I called him up and I gave him the dimensions. I said, I want them plowed out on the sides for the ropes. I want single pane windows and I want, and I don't want finger jointed wood. That's where they join wood to get long pieces like this. And that's just not good. And they said, are you kidding? You want single pane windows and you want them plowed out for ropes? I said, yeah, and they made them for me. So, uh, and they're still in that house. Um, I, it's interesting because in 1939, the, the president of Anderson Windows sent a memo out uh, company-wide that said, look, we, we've clear-cut all the northern white pine. That's what all the sashes up until 1939 in this country were made out of. And we have to start using eastern white pine. 
which isn't nearly as rot resistant as northern white pine. So we're going to have to figure out a way to preserve it, treat it to keep it from rotting. So, you know, it's interesting how things morph over time. Yeah, no doubt. Um, uh, can you tell us where to purchase the metal and rubber weather stripping? Yeah, KillianHardware.com. Killian, K-I-L-I-A-N.com. Killian Hard, KillianHardware.com. Um, they are uh, the retailer for the Dorbin Metal Strip Company. I buy the, the, the rubber gasket materials called Santoprene, S-A-N-T-O-P-R-E-N-E, Santoprene rubber. Um, it's uh, available. Uh, I buy it all from Dorbin because I buy a lot, but you can also get it from Killian Hardware. Or um, there is a, a company that makes um, a, a whole bunch of weather strippings uh, called, um, oh, I can't, it'll be in the resource sheet when, when I get you the stuff. I know in Chicago, I was restoring something, um, a bunch of windows for the Winnetka Village Hall, which is in our North Shore, which is north of the city. Um, and we, and I was my, one of the things I had to do is I had to schlep out to Cicero, which is south of the city, <laughs> to get copper weather stripping. So I don't think there's a lot of local places where you can get it. Um, but it was some really great stuff. Some there's some place in Cicero. I did this paper. Well, and I think I think Dorbin will 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 actually sell to Chicago people, but they also make they make it uh, a brass version of this as well. And there's also what we call spring metal, which is made out of copper, and it's just not very good for windows because it doesn't contact all the wood all the way up at that. Um, that one's done. Um, okay, my house was built in 1898 and has all original windows on the first floor. The storms are circa 1950, those double hungs with aluminum. Um, they'd like to have wood screens or storms made, screens and storms made, any recs on where to find something that'll be historically correct. So oh, that's great. And so what you, what you want to do is go to so I, I mentioned this organization, which is the Window Preservation Standards Collaborative, but there's also the WPA, which is the Window Preservation um, Alliance, WPA, Window Preservation Alliance. And that is an organization that promotes window restoration and storm windows. So if you go to their site, they have a, the public can go on and see every single person that's in the Chicago area it's making wood storms or doing window restoration work, and you can find them there. That Adams Architectural, uh, the Dubuque Sash Company in Dubuque, Iowa, also has a company called Adams Architectural, and they make wooden storms as well. So. Um, I have a 1924 bungalow with all original windows, but none of them open. They don't explain why. I'm guessing paint might be a factor, but um, any other theories on that? Well, they don't open probably because there's painted shut or cocked shut. And that's when about the point in time when you go get this Gothic torture tool, <laughs> yeah. and cut the paint lines. There's a woman uh, for, uh, that's a part of the, the Window Preservation uh, Collaborative out in California who has this huge business where all she does is go around uh, Northern California and get windows operating. She doesn't do complete restoration. She just gets your window so the top and bottom sash operate. And she's got this big thing where she tents off the window and so the no lead dust gets in your house. And she's fabulous and wonderful. That's hilarious. I know somebody who's used a pizza cutter doing that even. Um, <laughs> all kinds of tools. Um, if I'm using wood putty on the bottom of a sash in a weather seal, would I add weep holes to the sash? If you if if you're using architectural epoxy at the bottom rail or the bottom of the size, what we call the style, you definitely want to take a real small drill bit and drill up through the putty into the good wood above so any moisture that gets above the patch can seep through. Okay. Interesting. Um, can I use Sarco putty on the bottom of a wooden door that is starting to rot like that pedestal you showed? No, you can't use sarco putty. That's a glazing putty that, that, that does the angle glazing on, on panes of glass. You definitely can use the Abitron. Use the liquid 50-50 and the putty 50-50, and, and you can repair the rod on the bottom of the door all day long. 
And then you want to drill some holes up through it because it's at the bottom so that moisture can weed through it. Okay. Um, I know we've got time for maybe two more. Um, uh, sorry. Let me see here. Come on, Carla. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I know there's so many and they keep jumping. Um, I have a type of old casement window that opens inside that I'd like to know how to insulate. This I've heard a lot over the years. I think it's spring bronze that's there now. Can I use the dormant system or should I try to replace the spring bronze? Well, spring bronze can be a, a, a one part of the weather stripping for a casement window. The other side of it is what we call the strip door weather stripping. So you've got this metal strip with a, with, with a rubber gasket all along the edge that, that, that door shut to. So you screw it on the door jam and you shut the door to it. And then the rubber contacts the door. You can use that on casement windows as well. I don't have a piece right here, um, but it, it's long metal strips and with a rubber edge and it just screws to a door. It's the same thing as a casement window. And if you have interior opening casement windows, you can put an exterior storm on the outside of it as well. Okay. Um, all right, my bungalow sunroom has huge vintage storm windows. I'm able to remove the other storms from within the house, but these are too heavy. I'd love to hear how to remove these with the ladder rope method that you'd mentioned. <laughs> so you want to have two ladders up on gigantic storms like that, one on each side, and you have two people to get up get it unhooked from the inside and it takes two people and then you just walk it down. It's a two ladder situation for really big storms. That's how we do it. Okay. And I think that's about all we had time for, but a bunch of these questions too. Um, I want to remind people we have local um, recommendations for contractors on the Chicago bungalow site as well. If you click on trusted referrals uh, at chicagobungalow.org, we've got a bunch of people listed. And Bob mentioned he's gonna send us a bunch of resources as well. So in our follow-up email, everyone who signed up for this is gonna get a link that'll to, uh, that'll, to this presentation that was recorded. Um, and then also we'll have some sort of a link um, with whatever resources we get from Bob as well. Um, but I think- uh, have people, Carla, have people be patient. I, I, I leave at 4.30 in the morning for Salt Lake City to do a window uh, thing for the city. <laughs> so I'll be back. Uh, in the office next Wednesday, and that's when I'll get it for you. Okay, we've learned a lot of patience during this pandemic. I think we're all okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, thank you so much, Bob. This is always, always entertaining to hear you and all of your anecdotes and also all of the sort of how the sausage is made um, behind the scenes with the windows companies and um, all, the, all the nonsense that we can sort of navigate through more easily now. Thank you so much. It was so great. Thank you so you. much. Thank you, Chicago. I love Chicago. Fabulous. Um, all right. I'm going to go rent blue vinyl now for the evening and uh, <laughs> have a good one. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.